Parshas Lech Lecha. Lech Lecha. What does Lech Lecha mean? Go. Go find yourself. Go for your own good. What's, what's some other phrases we could throw out? So much Hebrew is, there's hardly any English words that would properly define that. But Lech Lecha. This is Avraham. This is the story of Avraham. Uh, the last or the, the setting of the historical sun on Noah was an interesting thing. Uh, we'll, we, we need to say some sort of preliminary remarks before we get to Abraham. Before Abraham, uh, we see that Noah has sons, Ham, uh, uh, Yepeth, and Shem, Shem. And these three sons um, are going to carry, are supposed to, carry the knowledge of Torah uh, to the nations that was passed down from, uh, from Adam to Noah. Uh, Ham ends up getting in the bad situation of doing something really irresponsible. And it seems that it wasn't Ham himself, but probably his son uncovered the nakedness of his father, which could have varied for many different reasons. It's been explained as some level of sexual perversion. More than likely, if we use the Torah to interpret the Torah, he exposed his, his, uh, his Noah's wife, his grandma, grandmother. Uh, but whatever it was, there was a curse that was pronounced upon Ham and, and uh, Canaan. And this, this curse was is that they were to dwell in the, uh, they were to serve in the tents of Shem. Now, we understand that in, the, in, the, um, in every curse that Hashem brings, there's a tremendous amount of chesed, the loving kindness, to rectify or to fix the situation. We learned this for the first time with Adam. Adam was when he and um, Eve had eaten of the garden, of the fruit of the tree, of a knowledge of good and evil. Uh, Hashem merely pushed them out of the garden and closed the garden off because if they would eat of the tree of life, they would never die. And the whole point would be is to live forever in, the, in a state in which knowing good and evil without the full refinement of the neshama is a horrible situation. So God shows mercy. And then Cain kills Abel. And then what is the judgment there? We realize that Cain did not necessarily know he was murdering his brother. Right? So mercy was shown. He said, you're going to be marked for the rest of your life. So in essence, he went to like the city of refuge. He, he hid out for the rest of his life. Now we have the story of Cain, and this mercy is established, or this loving kindness of Hashem is established for Cain. And he says, forever you will be in servitude to your brothers. But if you dwell in the house of Shem, you could rectify that. Why? What is the representation? What does that term mean? If you dwell in the in the tents of Shem, the study of Torah. Anytime we hear the concept to dwell in the tent of, means that that person was responsible for teaching you and instructing you. Shem lives this very long, very prosperous life, and we are going to discover him in this this uh, historical period of Avraham because. Abraham is going to meet the Malikzadik or the uh, that is there at Shalom, and that he is that he is the priest of the Most High. No one has ever been given that title, the priest of the Most High. So he was like a priest. He was offering offerings to to Hashem, and he was guiding people and teaching them the universal laws of the Torah that were passed down from Adam. And that is where Noah, I mean, uh, where Abraham received his instruction in the Torah, and received his guidance in the Torah. And later on, Yaakov did the same thing. And so in the text, we, we talked about it right before, I think Charlie had a question, uh, chapter 10, verse 20, 26, uh, is the um, 25. Eber uh, is also the person that took over the Academy of Shem. This was the genealogy, and it talks about Eber. Eber was the one who took over the uh, teaching of the Torah, universal Torah, uh, from, from, uh, from um, Shem. 
the Parsha Lech Lecha starts off um, with God saying to Abraham, Lech Lecha, go, go forward. Before this happened, there was the Tower of Babel. There was the dividing of the languages, the 70 nations. There was idolatry to the hilt. There were no people except for the descendants of Noah who were living according to the universal Torah laws that were given to Adam. They were the only people that were living this sort of righteous life. Abraham, being influenced by a father who was a pagan idol maker, right? And being a pagan idol maker, uh, Avram, Abraham, uh, had, Avram at the time, um, really did want to know Hashem, really wanted to connect to the God of the universe. And he was well enough uh, a, a sort of raised in an environment of the knowledge of there being one God to know that this, this was something's just not right about the whole idol worship stuff. The story of the Midrash says that Abraham one day is tending his father's shop. You guys will remember this. And he decides to take an axe or a hammer or some blunt object to all the idols. And then when his father comes home, he says, what happened? And he says, this God right here came in and start, smashed all the other gods. And his father said, that's impossible. They don't, they don't do this. They're, they're just inanimate objects, right? And Abraham was like, ah, I got you. But there was a test of Abraham. What was that first test that he had? First test, according to Midrashic sources, is Abraham was arrested by the king uh, for his rebellion against idolatry and uh, is threatened to be put into a fire. He refuses to recant his attitude toward idolatry and his, his testimony of Hashem. And so he's thrown in the fire. When he's thrown in the fire, what happens? He doesn't burn. And he is able to then escape because they obviously let him live. If he could live through the fire, he would live. So those were the first, uh, the first test. It says here in the, in the Mishnah that the first and second test states that Abram was tied, uh, tried by ten tests. This is found in Abos 5.3. First, Nimrod sought to kill him because of his belief in one God, then forced Abraham into hiding for 13 years. Secondly, uh, on refusing to bow down to an idol, Abraham was thrown into a fire by Nimrod, only to be saved by a miracle. Why is there no mention of these two tests in the written Torah? Surely, they are remarkable acts of courage. A person's connection to Hashem can be based on either a rationalization or revelation. If a person's worship is essentially rational, it is bound by human limitations. A person who serves God based on divine revelation enjoys an unlimited form of worship since the parameters are determined by God, who is unlimited. For this reason, Judaism is based on the latter approach. Consequently, Abraham's first two tests were omitted from the written Torah, the most fundamental text of Judaism since they preceded God's first revelation to Abraham, the system on which Judaism is based. What is the difference between Abraham and Noah? He wanted to share the knowledge of Shem to the world, knowledge of one God. Noah did what he was told to do. Now, if you remember the class that uh, Ara did Thursday, he mentioned the fact that, um, that Noah was, felt secure in the Teva, in the Ark. It's a comfortable place. He didn't do any more than what God asked him to do. He did exactly what Hashem asked him to do. He didn't pray for anybody else. He only took care of his family. Now, he was very dedicated to the mitzvah. The tivo means word. So the idea is he was committed in, in davening or prayer and, um, and, um, and Torah, the knowledge of Torah, the knowledge of the mitzvahs. But it was all about him and his family, not about anybody else. Noah is gives us an understanding of the world of the Noahide. Mm -hmm. Follow me. The world of the Noahide is a person who comes and who is not like the rest of the world. They're not idolaters. They listen to God. They hear the voice of God. But they're just satisfied with the Sheva Mitzvot. 
don't want to bug me with any more. Just I'll do the Shavu Mitzvot and I'm happy. I love Hashem and I'll do His purpose. Whenever He asks me to do something, I'll do it, but I'm satisfied with this. That's why Noah has this whole concept of the Noahide laws. He was given seven laws to do his descendants. But the problem is, is in this day and time, we have a, um, what do you call it, a, a firestorm of Noahides who are now wanting to take on more than the Shava Mitzvot. And so what are we seeing in our modern day history is yet this time period being re re-realized in the modern age were the descendants of Noah who would become like Abraham you see the difference now along that continuum will be people called the Ger who will follow along that continuum for some period of time and maybe never reach the place of as Rabbi Greenbaum said today a certificate of conversion what was Abraham's certificate of conversion circumcision Right? So he wrote his own certificate of conversion. So the issue is, is that a person who commits themselves to the Shabbat Mitzvot, they're safe in the Teva. They have an ark. They have something that keeps them afloat in life, gives them instructions, that protects their family. But they're satisfied with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. However, in the, in the hindsight of the great rabbis, Rashi, Rambam, etc., they would look at Noah and ask this question, would he even be righteous in Abraham's day? I take a little different look at that because it doesn't matter. Hashem said he was righteous. Correct. Regardless of what the sages say, in hindsight, you look back and you go, oh, you know, compare, you know, if he was living in the same town with Abraham, would he really be considered righteous? The point is, it doesn't matter what I think. Hashem said, he was righteous in his generation. So the point is, is that is a righteous man. And at the same time, when we look at people who have come out of their idolatry into the B'nai Noach uh, uh, world of the B'nai, B'nai Noach, they are righteous in the eyes of Hashem. They are righteous in the eyes of Hashem. They are fulfilling what they're supposed to do. But see, Abraham was not supposed to be a Noach. Wasn't supposed to be. Now, what was, what did God ask Abraham to do? To go. Did he tell him where to go? Go to a land I'm going to show you. That's pretty innocuous, right? I mean, ambivalent. Can you imagine him being told by the voice of God, just go? And he's willing to do it. But before he were to go, what were the th the three things he was required to do? Leave his land, leave his family, and his, what? His people. His stuff. You're supposed to leave it. What is the secret to a person finally moving out of the world of the Noahide gear to conversion is you have to leave. You have to leave your stuff. And that's tough. We know people that make that decision to convert, and it is tough. Does that mean that everyone has to convert? No, we're not saying that. And that is not, not what we're saying. There's medication for that, by the way, Catherine. I'm just kidding. She's, Catherine's doing this. Yeah, I know, I know. It just looked like you were, had lost your mind there for a moment. I'm just picking. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll, I'll t take that off the tape. So he's asked to do three things. And many people who are B'nai Noach or Ger, who really want to do more mitzvah and really feel themselves connected at, at the Neshama to the Jewish people, would like to convert. But the idea of leaving family, land, peoples, it's, you just can't do it. It's, it's almost impossible. It's getting out of your comfort zone. So the only way to take that final last step is to actually leave. 
it's to go. Go, involve yourself, connect yourself. But at some level, I do believe that the Ger Tzadik or the Ger Toshav, pers- or Ger Tzadik, person who really becomes a righteous Ger, takes on the mitzvahs of Hashem, knowing they're doing it without having to feel obligated. Uh, it's, they're a volunteer in what they're doing. In their process of doing this, they are, in essence, doing the same thing. Because to take on those mitzvah in your culture, you are isolated. You are no longer part of your culture. In many aspects, your family disowns you. Your family doesn't want to have anything to do with you. They think you're crazy, right? And, and the big one is when you leave your idolatry. Sorry about that. That was the evening prayer time. My phone notifies me of prayer. I'm sorry. So anyway, um, so you have to leave those things. And in, in essence, really, the, the B'nai Noach or the Ger ends up doing that at some level, right? It is about cutting your way off. Now, why are those three things so uh, such uh, an impediment to one finding themselves in the purpose of Hashem? Let's first talk about family. They can influence you. All of these can influence you. That's the issue. All of these, your family can influence you. Your culture can influence you. The society you live in, like, uh, but everybody else doesn't do this or do that. Say again. And your things. I mean, the power of being in a a from community is amazing because it just there's it. It is so much easier to live a an orthodox life in community. It's almost impossible outside of that community. And so many of us realize that, and that's why there is that struggle of what do I do? Do I move? When do I not move, et cetera? Right, right. Oh, you guys have an amazing, yeah. Right. I, that's that's amazing. I don't I don't know that any of us have that with our families. So it's it's an incredible blessing. If if you're like uh, our situation, you go to a family member's house, and you have so many restrictions you put on yourself that it's a little odd. So you almost kind of avoid those situations altogether, right? So you know, it's I forgot what my. Uh, went to somebody's house and they, they said, I'm gonna make breakfast. I said, don't worry about it. I said, I'll fix my own. Don't, don't worry about it. You just take care, of it. I'll fix my own breakfast. They said, no, I've already started the biscuits and I'm gonna make biscuits, eggs, and bacon sandwiches. And I said, I said well, I don't eat bacon. She goes, oh, that's not a problem, I've got ham. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, just can you put it in one of those bacon bowls? That's all I want. They don't know. They don't know. They don't know. And so you, you, you live your life really alienated from your family. And what we are experiencing in our, in our society today and in this, this, this time of redemption, that people are coming out of the woodwork that are like Abraham. They just hear the voice of God to say, go. And so you've been in this... XYZ church or you've been in this denomination for God knows how many years and all of a sudden you you start feeling this unsettled feeling as if I'm a stranger here I don't even belong here I don't know what it is and it's a gnawing it's a gnawing you know you know that there are some things that are absolutely wrong and you're going to go through the test and I want you to understand something Abraham had to go through 10 tests right we can enumerate those later on uh, maybe Wednesday we can do that, 10 tests. And the first two were the most difficult tests in which potentially could have lost his life. Later on with Pyro, with, with Pharaoh, he could have lost his life, but he said his wife is his sister, right? So the idea is that over and over there was these tests of his character and his, his commitment to Hashem. When you and I made the decision to step away from the world that we were living and we recognized that we are at some level a stranger in a strange land, the 
the tests that came to us were pretty difficult. It's tough having family members that don't talk to you anymore. It's tough having friends that cut you off because you're now considered, uh, yeah, I'm sure now, crazy. And it's tough. But no one leaves the goyish world of the Gentile life to enjoin themselves to, to call Israel and Judaism without having to go through the same difficulties, trials, and tribulations that every Jew has gone through. You're just not going to do it. There's no easy way. Bottom line, there's no easy way. And I don't believe that Judaism has, even if they, I believe that if Judaism ironed out all the kinks in the conversion process, didn't have any. You show up, go through the base thin, they look at you, look at your past, boom, they stamp your record, you're converted. Go down to the mikvah and get, even if they took all those out, your personal life will be fraught with difficulties. Why? Because that is the, that is the way the Jewish neshama becomes refined is through difficulties and tests. How does Hashem know our loyalties except that our ethics, our musar has been tested over time? And so what happens is we all go through these sort of testing, and if it's not within your immediate family, with your spouse or your children, it's with your, you know, your next family layer out, and if it's not with them, it's people within the community that just don't understand you. And especially if you guys living, there's nobody like you guys out there. What's the name of the town? What? Village Mills. Village Mills. It's not a town. Just somewhere up there. Out there. It's in the woods, in the piney. Pine, yeah, yeah. He's out in the, in the big thicket area, I guess, right? Yeah. So, you know, they love Hashem, and, and, and in, some, in many aspects, they have been a part of this community through the Internet, and they're, they're working on the process of trying to figure out when do we move to Houston to start a conversion process, and it's a big one. But I must say that Hashem never lets, allows a person to go without when they commit to Hashem. Never. Never. I've never seen the righteous, what? Forsaken or his seed. Malek David. King David writes these words. The righteous will never be forsaken. So all we have to contend with is how do I continue to live at the highest level of holiness and righteousness before Hashem. He says here, he tells uh, uh, Abraham this. He says, for your own benefit, lech lecha, for your own benefit, leave from your land, your birthplace, and your father's house to the land which I will show you. The benefit is to our favor that we separate ourselves from the world and a strange land. It is to our benefit when we start going, I don't want that influence. The problem is, is you can't keep your feet in both worlds and not expect to be affected heavily by it, right? So he says, I will make your name great. Now, how does he end up making his name great? He adds a letter to Abraham's name. It's not Avram, it becomes Avraham, right? So he adds this letter. He says, and you will bless, you will bless, and I will bless those who bless you. There is an added commentary by Onkelos who says this, I will make your name great, and you will have the power uh, to bless other people. And I will bless those who bless you. I will curse any person that curses you. All the families of the earth will be blessed. Their children to be like you. You, you, Abraham. Abram left as God told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 25 years old when he left Haran. Abram took Sarai, Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, all the possessions in which they had acquired and the people and they had converted in Quran, and they departed and headed for the land of Canaan. Now let me ask you this. Why didn't he go immediately when he left Ur? 
why did he go to Hanan or Haran and stay? Anybody ever asked that question? He was there for quite a while. His father was with him. His father was with him. In Rashi sources says that God did not want his father to go with Abraham because he would have influenced him. So he had to wait for his father to die. And another reason why Hashem didn't tell Abraham where he was going to go at the first time was because his father would have heard. And his father would have been, yeah, that's great. I want to go with you. We could start an idol store right there in Jerusalem. Right? We'll go to Shechem and we'll start a idolatry supermarket, right? Which ended up happening anyway, but who knows? Okay. Uh, so uh, it says they arrived at the land of Canaan. Avram traveled through the land as far as the uh, area of Shechem, uh, which is in the plain of Moriah. As a matter of fact, that's where uh, Rabbi Moshe Goldsmith is at, not far from there in Itamar. Uh, at, that, at that time, the Canaanites were, uh, were in possession of the land. God appeared to Avram and he said, I will give this land to your descendants. Then Avram built an altar there to God who had appeared to him. He moved to send his tent from there to the mountain which rests at Bethel, where he uh, pitched his wife's tent first and then his own tent. Bethel was to the west and Bethel to the east. He built uh, an altar there to God and he prayed in the name of God. Abraham was a good husband, wasn't he? He built his wife a tent and his a tent. Now, how many of you guys have built your wife a house and then built you a house? That's righteous. Of course, I would say that's smart, but I don't. I'm going to get in trouble, on it. You could have a great marriage. It lasts forever that way, right? See, those of us who have been married over so much, you know, 30 some odd years to the same person, you tend to think, like, well, that wasn't a bad idea. What are the fourth and fifth tests? I'm just picking. Not really. But anyway, do, do what now? It, that's the women's tent. Uh, so he was building, he was, had to put in the kitchen. That makes sense. Thank you, Charlie. Yeah, the way to a man's heart is his stomach. That's why Shem felt is so strong about kosher, right? Yes, ma'am. Oh, absolutely. Right. Absolutely, and you know what? It's possible that that she was part of the reason why they didn't immediately go. Who knows? I mean. According to the Masoretic text, the term his tent is written uh, at, with an olive hay, lamed hay, which can be read her tent. First, he pitched his wife's tent and after his own. Interesting, the reason why they got that whole idea that he pitched her tent first. How does Rashi know that Abraham erected his wife's tent before his own, perhaps he put up his own tent first, is the question. Rashi's words are based on the Talmud statement that a person should give more honor to his wife than to himself. Right. Yeah, he, couldn't, he couldn't have thought, I, I couldn't imagine not taking care of my spouse first. Any man would be hopefully that way. Uh, what is the next fourth and fifth test? The fourth and fifth test is a famine in the land. And Avram went down to Egypt to settle there temporarily because of the famine in the land. Then when he approached Egypt, he said to his wife, uh, now I realize that you're an attractive woman. <laughs> Some of the Midrashic sources says she was a very beautiful woman in a world of beautiful people. And that when she was with the Egyptians, the women weren't that weren't that pretty. They were kind of ugly, and so she was going to be really beautiful. So think about that. She was a beautiful woman with beautiful people, 
That's why in Ur, she was an average woman. She goes to Egypt, and it's like, she is an amazing looking woman. So he says, when the Egyptians will see you, they will say, it is his wife. They will kill me and keep you alive. Why is that the case? Even the pagans at that time would not take a man's wife and have a relationship with her. But they would kill you and then take your wife. Right? So they had, what do they call it? They, they do have some moral somewhere, right? So, so the, the uh, it says, uh, please say that you're my sister so that I, I, they will uh, favor me because of you and my, lo- and my life will be spared thanks to you. So it happened, and then Avram came to Egypt, and the Egyptians saw the lady was very attractive. Uh, Paro's ministers saw her, and they praised her among themselves, and she was uh, that she was fit for Pharaoh. I mean, obviously, she was such a beautiful woman. All of the worker bees around and the people that were there were going, this should be a queen. She is a queen, right? The, uh, the lady was taken from the house of Paro. She, he uh, bestowed gifts on Avraham because of her. So Avraham... Uh, had flocks, cattle, donkeys, manservants, maidservants, she donkeys, and camel, camels. God uh, afflicted Pharaoh and his household with a severe disease because of Abraham's wife. Abraham's wife, according to Midrashic sources, prayed to an angel and asked the angel to afflict Pharaoh so he doesn't touch her. Smart move. Pharaoh summoned Abraham and said, "Have what have you done to me? Why, did you, why didn't you tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she was my sister, causing me to take her as a wife for myself? Look, here is your wife. Take her. Go. Boy, does it sound familiar? This happens 400 some odd years later, right? Pyro gave men's orders to protect Avram. They escorted him and his wife and all their possessions. The next, say again. And, yeah, including her slave. So not only did he go into Egypt, in a desperate situation to save his life, but he left there a richer, wealthier man. So, in, in essence, we are discovering that a person that truly does lech lecha, listens to the voice of God, and, and, and heads off. We don't know where we're going, do we? When you first started this journey, did you have any idea that you would be here? No way. No possible way. Same here. I mean, I couldn't, even, I couldn't have even fantasized about this and figured it out. So the idea, and I I used this term uh, a couple of weeks ago. You may or may not have, uh, what do you call it, Um, inner tube down a river, right? Go in West Texas and beautiful rivers. Get on an inner tube and just float. Let the river take you. In essence, lech lecha is allowing the river of Hashem to carry you. You... You only must concern yourself with staying on the floating device. And what is the floating device in our life? It's the Torah. It's prayer. It's a commitment to to keep a stable life. Hashem will guide you at the right place at the right time. Some things are going on this, this, this week, and Ira and I were talking about it, and I asked him, you know, if he was concerned about it. I I can't say it on, on the on the camera, but I'll tell you later. And and he, I, I, t- I told him, says I can't be concerned about anything anymore, because Hashem is in complete control of our lives, complete control. I mean, absolutely complete control. There is no doubt in my mind. And if I ever find myself where things are spiraling out of control, where I at some level begin to lose my confidence that Hashem is in control, then I need to ask myself, am I truly Am I truly lech lecha? Am I truly going for my own benefit to go find where God wants me to be? Because since I started this place of my life for the last few years, unbelievable. Unbelievable how Hashem has brought us this far. And I was reminded of um, uh, Shabbos. We're all in here and it's noisy and kids are playing. and Everybody's having fun and we go off into the side room to look at the Torah scroll. And there was, I don't know, eight, seven or eight people in there. And it was almost as if they had entered into the king's chamber. No one was talking loud. Everybody very respectfully stood there and looked at the Torah scroll, and some would touch the 
the cloth, the, uh, the cover. And to look at that level of reverence and respect for the word of Hashem was so rewarding. We're living in a world where no one has respect for authority. And for sure, there are cultures in religion, both Judaism and in Christianity, who have no reverence for the word of Hashem. None. Because they have relegated it to not even being important in their life. Right? There are whole cultures of religious thought that says that the Torah was for Moshe, and not even sure whether Moshe had anything to do with it. So we're living in that culture right now. I want to do one more uh, thing before we close on this, and I want to talk about Abraham and Lot parting company. And then we're going to pick up on God's promise uh, to Abraham about the land, and we're going to talk about on Wednesday the covenant that God made with Abraham. What was that covenant? And we're going to talk about some of the misconceptions that are taught in Christianity about that covenant versus what Jewish thought is about that covenant. It's going to be an interesting idea. But let's talk about uh, Abraham and Lot for a moment. When Abraham got to, got to a place to settle down, they basically are standing uh, at having to make a decision. One's going to take one area of the country and the other's going to take another area. You know, maybe there was issues, and well, we do know there was issues between their herds, right? They were having problems with the mixing of the herds. So the best thing was for them to get some land separation. Where does Lot decide to settle? In the best land, Sodom and Gomorrah. Right? Oh boy, so this is the lesson that I have to talk. It's about me, right? And it's about all of us, I guess, but I have to think about this. In our journey to Lach Lacha, sometimes the best places are not the best place. Follow? Well, sometimes the best place that would benefit you materialistically, socially, emotionally, is not necessarily the best place spiritually for you to be. And so in our journey to fulfill what Hashem has asked us to do, and that is go for your own benefit, you're not doing this for me. You're doing this for you. I mean, this is something we have to realize is that Hashem didn't call Abraham out of Ur of Chaldees to make Abraham miserable and to try to go search for, our, uh, you know, for an invisible God. That was not the situation. Abraham already believed in Hashem and heard the voice of God. Abraham already had a connection to Hashem. But why in the world would Abraham leave why would he leave without a promise? God didn't promise him anything until he asked him to leave. And then he didn't actually give him the covenant until he was gone and in the land. He knew. He knew something. What did he know? It wasn't necessarily what he knew. It was who he knew. He had confidence in Hashem. And that is the difference between a person who has committed their life in connection with Hashem and a person who's on the peripheral of a relationship with Hashem. He was confident that if Hashem said to do it, it was going to pay off. It's just That's just bottom line. Hashem's going to pay off. It's going to work out. I may not, it's going to be a little odd and uncomfortable, but we never really hear Abraham, Abraham complain. Not one time does he complain about his circumstances. This is a guy who circumcises himself and then sets outside of his tent waiting on guests to show up. That's the, uh, that's the man, right? Real man, right? But this is a man committed. So when we see this, what does Abraham do? Abraham clearly could have chosen that other land, that place where Lot went. God would provide. And I think, I believe that if Abraham would have been in Sodom and Gomorrah, Sodom and Gomorrah probably would have been destroyed. Because at some level, he would have helped to transform a society to have a more loving compassion toward other humans. Because they were not a compassionate group of people. And so we understand that Sodom and Gomorrah is not about sodomy and homosexuality, even though there may have been. Because there was all kinds of sexual perversion. But it was about <coughs> lacking compassion upon other human beings. They had no compassion on human beings. The choice that Lot makes 
ultimately is going to affect not only Lot, but Abraham. So sometimes the choices other people make in your life is going to require you to go above and beyond the call of duty to try to snatch them out of their situation. But know that these are part of the test. We all have these kinds of tests. And so when these tests come, don't get upset. Don't get downhearted. Just know I have to respond. And so you have to respond at the highest level of your ethics, the highest level of your musar in your life. And then when you do that, you know that God's going to work it out. He's going to work it out fine. It just seemed like that every time Abraham turned around in a bad situation, came out always better on the back end of it. The Jewish people have always faced very difficult times. And what we know from the prophets, in the end, it's going to turn out really fine. It's going to turn out good. That concludes the class. Any questions, fears, doubts, unbeliefs? Now's the time to do it. Questions, comments?